Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. A few brief points here about the SEC versus Ripple lawsuit, this coming from John Deaton. If SEC, if the SEC truly believed today XRP is an illegal security, it would have sought a preliminary injunction to stop ongoing sales. I've actually heard John Deaton say this in the past, and uh, he's just retweeted this out again just yesterday. But it is interesting to note, Ripple can literally sell XRP to hire as many lawyers as it desires to fight the SEC. Illegal sales of XRP are used to win and allow future illegal sales. So it's something to consider, because if we take a look at the SEC's history against Block 1, this from Ripple I, Block 1 was a legit scam and deserved a cease and desist order from the SEC. But again, why did Ripple not get one as well? And so Ripple Eye down here just posting the cease and desist order from Block One when they got sued by the SEC, ordering instituting cease and desist proceedings pursuant to Section 8A of the Securities Act of 1933, making findings and imposing a cease and desist order. So they were stopped from selling tokens, yet we never got one from the SEC. Things that make you go, hmm. So great tweet there from John Deaton and Ripple Eye. Stefan Hubert also bringing up some fishy information. Let's put it this way, Dr. Metz, who by the way was the expert witness on the SEC side, uh, he, was, he is a career expert witness for the SEC and has not exactly been crowned with success. At least he does not seem to have convinced Judge Torres with his last and only hearing he did before. And he did this in front of Judge Torres of all judges that he could have. Mets, uh, have you ever been deposed before SEC versus Rio Tinto? Yes, one time. He mentions here in the transcript. And uh, sure enough, U.S. judge rejects the SEC's bid to expand Rio Tinto's fraud lawsuit on Mozambique coal business. And who is the ruling judge here? None other than Judge Annalisa Torres. The SEC argued that some of the dismissed claims should be restored in light of a subsequent U.S. Supreme Court decision in an unrelated case. But that bid was knocked back on Wednesday. Um, so more strikeouts for the SEC. Also this from XRP Crypto Wolf. Uh, just thought I would bring this to your attention. The math doesn't check out either. A triple fail. The SEC is now arguing that the rules governing motions to exclude expert discovery favor the plaintiff and preclude the supplemental report. A statistical analysis of the economic significance of Ripple's news announcements would confer an unwarranted advantage on the defendants. In conclusion, the agency believes the opinions of Dr. Metz should not be stricken nor precluded. What a poorly written response. It's repetitive, a sign of a weak argument. This is a quote. It wrongly accuses Ripple of failing to follow proper procedure when the failure was the SEC's and almost comically offers to consent to reopening a deadline the SEC blew. This coming from James K. Filan. It is not only the SEC's inconsistencies in response to Ripple's motion to strike that are coming under fire. The report itself has been found to fail at basic math. And so Twitter user the XRP Arsenal pointed out 97 out of 500 news uh, price rises account for around 20% of the data. Uh, it was observed that 40% of BTC and Ethereum moved resulted in XRP moves. So last time I checked, 40% is more than 20%. In addition, 40% of the last seven years that were analyzed equates to about 1,022 days, 10 times the amount of days that Dr. Metz states that XRP was subject to positive movement due to Ripple news. So it actually does look like these stats just serve to prove XRP is more bound to the wider market than Ripple. And I mean, we've seen this on the chart numerous times. When the market goes up, XRP goes up. When the market goes down, XRP goes down. That is no secret, but you know, they got to prove it in court, obviously. And uh, it looks as though <laughs> Dr. Metz's uh, math was off and this actually benefiting Ripple's case. You can't make this stuff up, guys. I'm gonna shift gears a bit to the entire market, debt forgiveness, what we are seeing now in the US, you know, we are seeing huge inflation, not just in the US, worldwide. The price at the pumps, if you guys drive a car, I'm sure you're feeling it. Um, and so I saw this from CNN posted by Lucky John underscore XRP. From CNN Business, credit reporting agencies will wipe out most medical debt. So they are realizing people are in a crunch and are likely not able to afford their medical bills. So Equifax, Experion, and TransUnion will eliminate billions of dollars from the accounts of consumers who face unexpected medical bills that they were unable to pay. The three firms said that they have made the move after months of research. And this coming from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, and they found some statistics showing that Americans had racked up $88 billion of medical debt on consumer credit records as of June of 2021, so less than a year ago. It's the most common debt collection credit account on credit records, the CFPB said. So medical debt, 
Of course, just one of those debts that uh, people have trouble paying for. And this in a financial environment where we're experiencing inflation like nobody's business. And so of course, you know, this tied to the Great Reset, this tied to a failing economic system that the powers that be ultimately want to bring down, but under the guise of, oh look, there's a war and therefore there is inflation and oh look, there's a beer flu and that's why economies are shut down and we're seeing problems with supply chain and prices are wonky, so on and so forth. But really guys, at the end of the day, it's because the financial system is messed up, has been for decades. The first inklings of this was in 2008 when we had the big financial crisis. Since then, you know, the banks got bailed out by government money, but this was only a Band-Aid solution. They were trying to prop up the system, couldn't prop it up anymore, and so enter the beer flu. Now in 2022, enter the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Very, very convenient ways to say, hey, look, look at what's happening with your money. Not to mention what is also coming down the pipe with CBDC, central bank digital currencies. I mean, you know, I'm not gonna go over these, but I will link them in the description. The United States is accelerating the digital dollar. Just uh, a recent article that just came out from Dodo Finance here, uh, brought to me by DJ Peter Vass. Over here, Cryptic Poet brought this in just in. Malaysian ministry proposes legal tender of cryptocurrencies. So they are starting to look at cryptos in a different way, perhaps utilizing different cryptos. It doesn't say anything about CBDCs here particularly, but utilizing cryptocurrencies as payment. Uh, I mean, we've heard from El Salvador and even Mexico wanting to use Bitcoin as legal tender and other countries as well wanting to utilize cryptocurrencies. Um, and then this one from Michael at Val5 Links, Australian Senator Andrew Bragg opened the Australia Blockchain Week conference with a bombshell legislative proposal that he hopes will lay the groundwork for a new digital asset ecosystem down under. So again, examining cryptocurrencies as a means of payment, whether it be a CBDC or other cryptos, we're going to have to think about money in a different way. And you know, it is looking very, very good for XRP hodlers. I mean, if you hold XRP, XLM, any of the WEF coins, really, I think us hodlers, guys, I think we have a leg up. Um, I wanted to talk about this tweet thread in particular while keeping XRP in mind, okay? Because money and the concept of money changes all the time. This is an interesting in-depth analysis uh, by Tasha at Tasha Labs here on Twitter. What is money? Will crypto change money? Some controversial opinions here. We have to think about where we are in terms of history. I mean, Likely, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but you probably haven't been on this planet that long. When you consider the history of economies and the history of finance, how money has looked differently over the years. And so when you read this tweet thread, uh, Rath Economist brought it up, you know, keep XRP in mind, because I think when looking at this and understanding what's going on, we as XRP hodlers are going to see some pretty positive things come out of this. So she starts this off. The world has more types of money than at any point in history. 164 government currencies plus gold, silver, CDs, repos, treasuries, and numerous other quasi money. If we count crypto tokens, types of money are literally exploding. Bringing up a graph here uh, and the different types of fiat currencies in uh, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Australian region here. Uh, and you can see, I can't really tell, this graphic is kind of blurred, but you guys can see all the many different fiat currencies that exist. Money is going through some serious change. Before we talk about where it's headed, let's first look at how it become what it was today. Three perspectives on what money is that I find especially helpful. So money as a technology for mass economic collaboration. In case it's not obvious, money is a tool for transacting among strangers. When you lived in a Mesopotamian village, where all 50 people in the village were related, money was useless. Exchanges in micro economies typically operate as gift systems. So you gift your cousin five apples today, he gifts you five peaches tomorrow, your shared social graph keeps gifting reciprocal and fair through mutual trust. Money becomes useful when you venture to trade with folks from far and away villages whom you may have never uh, done trades with before. Uh, money or currency operates as a neutral real-time database of values to be exchanged. So this is just going into the history, the, the, the concept of money. Side note, tis why your sister thanks you for gifting her microwavable slippers that she does doesn't need at Christmas, but uh, will feel insulted if you gift her a $50 bill instead. Subconsciously, our ancestral tribal part of the brain still tells us money equals 
treated like strangers. Uh, money solves the problem of transacting without trust as long as you and other strangers both agree to use the same money, i.e. gold, copper rods, clothes, seashells, to track value. So we all have to agree on value. And uh, this is where the concept of Bitcoin is becoming very interesting today in this day and age. As we've been seeing over the last decade or so, Bitcoin value has gone up. And so there are more and more people now who are saying, yeah, let's accept Bitcoin as legal tender. And we are even seeing, you know, entire countries say, let's accept Bitcoin as legal tender just as a sidebar. From this lens, it's easy to see money is both a result and an enabler of commerce expansion. So we got to think about this in broader terms, commerce expansion. The more we trade with strangers, the more we need money. It's no wonder that post-war period of sweeping globalization in production and commerce also saw max expansion in broad money. So world money supply, which mirrors demand for money, grew from 50% of GDP to over 140% since the 1960s. If you count in various forms of quasi money, the number at least doubles. So here's just a quick graph, broad money, percentage of GDP, the world versus the United States. You can see that has just gone up exponentially and has been going up exponentially, especially in the last few years. Still, the scope of cooperation among strangers is limited by scope of social agreement on a particular money. If you and your counterpart don't agree on which money should be used or amount of value it represents, collaboration fails. So we have to get on the same page about this as well. Traditionally, getting different villages to agree on using the same type of money is a near impossible political challenge. Just look at how hard it was to get the euro off the ground and troubles that followed. Now guys, think about this in terms of XRP. Why XRP is going to be so valuable in the future? Um, you know, because we're already seeing this and today, more than at any point in history, do we have more money that needs to be transferred all around the world. She goes on to say, but borderless blockchain tokens seem to achieve this feat effortlessly. More on that in a second. Uh, and XRP just being one of those examples. Money as an efficient credit tracking system. In modern economy, relationship between money and credit has become like air and wind. Credit creation is money creation. It wasn't always the case. Now, in terms of credit, what does that mean? End of the day, credit is just a mechanism to allow time delay and value exchanges. In simple economies, credits don't need money to exist. Members of small societies can keep tabs on it, i.e. extend credit to one another. Uh, you have tabs open with your local bakery, bar, butcher shop, etc. So you are creating money by creating credit. Uh, and you know, the bigger this gets, the more money is therefore theoretically created. Those are original forms of credit, which we now call supplier financing. Problem with credit system like that is that it can't scale. Each producer or vendor has to run their own IOU database that don't talk to one another. Credits are segmented and they are kept small. But money puts credits on steroids. Not only does it make credits from different sources share common units and thus interchangeable, it also gets rid of the need for borrowers to deal with numerous creditors and pools lendable resources of society together at entities called banks. Now, if you extrapolate this to XRP, you can see how this can get even bigger and bigger. The efficiency will create more need because it's a lot easier to do, and therefore more of a bigger economy will result from this. So she says the result is bigger, faster credit creation at lower transaction costs. From this lens, it's easy to see that entities who are most in need of credit would also be the biggest proponents of the adoption of money, especially when they are the ones controlling the supply of said money. Those entities, you guessed it, Governments. Modern paper money, as we know it, began 300 years ago with the birth of the Bank of England uh, as a way to finance, i.e. extend credit. Uh, British government's war versus France. Now every crypto project runs the same playbook and used to be a government privilege. Talk about the democratization of finance. Government is usually the biggest borrower in any economy. It's no wonder that fast growth of broad money in past decades is accompanied by large increase in government borrowing. And so uh, we can see that here, claims on central governments. And we're seeing that in the US specifically, uh, huge amounts of these claims uh, from this chart. And if you think the lines above have gone up a lot, just take a look at Japan. And so compared to what we just saw up here, look at Japan in comparison, uh, even usurps both the world and the United States. Meanwhile, credits to the private sector have increased a lot too, but arguably less, especially since the 1990s. And uh, that's just monetary sector credit to private sector percentage of GDP. You can see those graphs there. Uh, so let's continue. How sustainable is the global run-up of credit, i.e. debt? is a debate for another day. 
My point here is money is the key enabler for credit creation at scale. So we got to think of money and the economy in terms of credit because not all physical money is utilized. There's a lot of imaginary borrowed money that is also being utilized. And so even that money needs to be transferred somehow. Think of it in terms of XRP guys, how big this is really going to get without which we wouldn't have a global market economy the size it is today. With private crypto tokens and other digital assets becoming increasingly money-like, global money supply is only going to further grow. So, you know, this states that the economy is just going to get bigger, which means more money is going to be moving around the world and to more places around the world as well. I foresee, uh, you know, like the continent of Africa, just as an example, they are really starting to come into their own. We are seeing, you know, you know, even with the unbanked and underbanked initiatives that Ripple has been talking about for years. This is going to democratize payments. This is going to allow people to be able to transact, people who maybe a decade ago weren't able to. So what it means for credit growth seems obvious. More on that in a second. Number three, money as unexercised claim on economic output. Unexercised is a key word here. Most of us think money equals purchasing power, i.e. it allows you to claim a slice of the economic pie of society, but on an aggregate level, it doesn't quite hold up. As we talk about world broad money stock is over 140% of the world GDP. That means hypothetically, if all holders of money globally are to cash out at once, to exchange for goods and services, we don't have enough GDP to go around to fulfill all the claims. So this points to a potential liquidity crisis if hypothetically this ends up happening. And I'm glad she brought this up because liquidity, 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 always been something that XRP can solve for. And so if you need more of that token, more value will be driven to it, more demand for the XRP token, which would mean that that would command a higher price. And in these types of scenarios, we are looking at high value transactions. So, you know, just bringing me back to that David Schwartz comment, XRP has to be a high enough price. It has to command a high enough price in order to fulfill these types of transactions. You know, right now when we're looking at it in the cross-border retail segment, we're not seeing those high value transactions and this is why we're not really seeing the need. But when push comes to shove, that's when we're going to see the price go up. Tasha goes on to say, uh, to put it another way, purchasing power, uh, uh, purchasing power, the world thinks it has a, uh, sorry, what is that? Purchasing power, the world thinks it has a 40% higher than it actually has. We've been collectively over imagining our purchasing power since 2008, when world money and GDP ratio crossed 100%. Before you shout Ponzi scheme or evil governments printing too much, it's more likely that we're actually witnessing a shift in the nature of money and credit. So that's an interesting theory here. Um, I mean, we all know the system is, or at least the way it ran before, is coming to an end and that we should embrace what is going to be a new financial system, whether we like it or not, and in what capacity governments are wanting to control it uh, is still up for debate. But the fact is, economies exist, we need a way to transfer value, XRP is already poised to be at the center of this, and we are now witnessing a shift in the nature of money and credit, which will only be accelerated with crypto and tokenization. So of course, not just XRP, uh, but other cryptocurrencies as well. With these three perspectives on money in mind, how should we think about ways crypto and blockchain may change money, credit, and the economy? By the way, do you like this so far? I write about ideas on investment, macro and human potential. So you can subscribe to Tasha's newsletter down here. Again, guys, a very in-depth thread about the history of money, how money is going to change, how the economy is going to change, all part and parcel to what we are seeing, the powers that be, tearing down an old financial system and replacing it with something new, obviously the tokenization economy, crypto being a central part of this, but it's only going to be a handful of cryptocurrencies that really changed the system. And also this idea of credit, right? More money is being created through credit, more global economies are trading, and you know, if you do not have trust in your neighbor, currencies are the way to transfer that value. And in this new economy, it might not just be traditional fiat currencies, like we've seen over the last several hundred years, as she uh, points out in this graph up here. We could be trading gold for groceries, guys. Think about this, think about inflation, think about how people today are hedging against fiat dollars by buying precious metals, uh, putting their money in hard assets. The good news, you know, that we heard all those years ago, XRP can source that liquidity and convert one thing of value, i.e. gold, for another thing of value, i.e. food. This is where we're really going to see the use cases, especially during the roughest times of this transition. 
That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And guys, I really want to try to hit 100,000 subscribers. So if you're finding yourself uh, watching the videos, but you're not subscribed yet, subscribe to the channel, like the video, a thumbs up never hurts. If you like the content I'm providing, I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.